I thought I would continue on where Albert uh, initially started, go into a little bit more details of next generation sequencing, and then go into some field applications that we've been investigating and some of the research that's been happening at the BDL and within my research group. So as Albert has mentioned, we're kind of in that era now where next generation sequencing, that term is, can be very confusing. Right now we're, we're on what we call second generation, or um, we call it an amplified single molecule sequencing. So within these machines, we have uh, Sanger 454, which basically is kind of gone now. That technology has went to the wayside. We have Illumina sequencing with the MySeq and HiSeqs. Uh, there's a solid, and then there's some uh, ion torrents from thermal. So this technology is considered very short read technology. The maximum length read you're going to get, or nucleotides that come out of this machine, are anywhere from 50 to 300 bases. So when you're trying to do this assembly of these viral genomes or even host genomes, it can be very difficult because these reads are short, especially if you're looking at bacterial sequencing where there's repeat regions and there's insertions and deletions. The short read technology is very difficult to get that together. So that's where we come, what we call the third generation sequencing, um, which is very long read technology. Now we're talking anywhere from 1,000 to 10,000 bases. So when we're trying to assemble those genomes, it's a lot easier. When we move into those technologies, uh, we have helicos. PacBile has been on the market for probably about oh, maybe 10 or years about now. It's finally getting to that point where it's matured enough that we can finally use it as an application. So Minnesota, uh, University of Minnesota has recently purchased one of those, so we'll be able to do some bacterial sequencing to understand the strain of divergence happening there. And then recently, um, Oxford Nanotechnologies has hit the market. Some of you may be aware that Dr. Murta and myself are working on a pen side uh, sequencing application for diagnostics. So this technology is very small, handheld, plug it into your machine, throw in a sample, and hopefully you're going to get some sequencing data that's useful. So some of the Oxford uh, technologies is very new, and it's uh, working out the kinks as we're going forward. So how does some of this different sequencing technology work? So with the application-based system, we take our genomic nucleic acid, go through a fragmentation using chemical uh, reagents, and then we ligate on some primers, which tell, or excuse me, uh, sequences or adapters, and that tells us that it's specific to each sample. That goes into another section where it actually does a round of amplification anywhere from 9 to uh, 17 cycles. So there is an amplification step that comes through. So when you're getting information out of the machine, you have to remember that some of that may be amplified due to this particular methodology happening. Versus where you look at nanopore technology, it's real-time analysis and sequencing of the nucleic acid as it's going through the uh, polymerase. So basically there's a polymerase there, it's going to replicate the nucleic acid, incorporate a G, and then it, when that happens it presses, reaches a signal, and it calls that. So this is happening in seconds. So really real-time, real fast compared to the other methodology where we had to do an application and then run it through a machine as well. So that's all those two different technologies. Um, kind of the basics of those two at the moment. And what we do to really save money at the veterinary diagnostic labs, or I think all the sequencing cores, is we try to pool these samples together. So when we're talking about cost for sequencing, there's two applications. One, we have to pay for the library prep, which is anywhere from $50 to $100, and then we gotta pay for the run on the machine, which is anywhere from $500 to $1,000. So if I put one sample on, I have to pay for that for that one sample, but if I can put five or ten samples on, now I significantly reduce the price per sample because I was able to multiply those all in one lane of machine. So how does that occur? So we have two different samples and we throw on different indexes or libraries. They go into the machine together, they get sequenced, and then the machine goes through and spits them out into different pools. So if I have ten samples, it's going to tell me that these ten samples are all different, and now I can go in and analyze those data sets. So I one of the most difficult things probably with this next generation sequencing is making sense of the mess that's coming out. So I had a postdoc in the lab, and I stole the slide from him, and I'm probably going to use it for a long time. So complete genome sequencing just don't come flying out of the machine. It's tiny genome pieces that we have to stitch together and make use of those. And that's what we call as assembly. So when we're trying to do this assembly, it's really hard to do it on a laptop or a desktop computer because you're dealing with 20, 50, 120 million reads of data that are pumping out. So what do we do? Well, we take our computers and we log into our supercomputers. So within this process, we can go in and run 20 samples all at the same time using these supercomputers that we have in our institute. So that allows us to be able to crank through more samples in a timely manner. 
So some of the tools that we're trying to di uh, develop the diagnostic lab to make uh, the generations of results a little bit faster is we're developing three different pipelines, or I have a couple developed already. First is basically a pipeline one, which is what did you, we sequence. When we sequence a sample, we get hosts, we get bacteria, we get viral, we get unknown reads. So this pipeline, which utilizes lots of different algorithms that I'm not going to talk about, basically just cleans up the sample and says, this is what is in the sample. Then we can take those viruses of interest, bacteria, uh, reads of interest, run them in the pipeline two. Again, lots of different algorithms are happening here, and that just does uh, genome assembly. And so when that comes out, we visualize and look at it, make sure that it's a good assembly, it looks accurate. And then lastly, we go into what we do, what we're calling like more of an annotation. So what genes are present? What's the variation within those genes? What SNPs are called? Did recombination events occur? So this is going to take a, a little bit more work, but I have a great postdoc in the lab that's been chugging through. We got one and two done, and pretty soon we're going to start on pipeline three. So how do we use this whole genome sequencing? And maybe some of you have seen this presentation before on PDB. I'm just going to uh, cover the highlights. Luckily, I only have one tree in this presentation, so if you really love trees, and you know that I love to show them, you can go see Seneca Valley. There's enough trees in there to make everyone happy for the whole conference, let me tell you. Um, so PDB, it's a 30 kb genome, and just like uh, its other relative in the Neoveridis family, uh, it has a, known as PERS, it has a long polyprotein, or a long or one that goes through a ribosomal slip, and other accessory proteins. So when we talk about PDB, think about what, what we've done here and how we can apply that to PERS going forward in the future. They're very similar to each other. They come from the major family. Um, and also, they go through this wonderful thing called recombination. So through natural evolution, we believe we, uh, our assumption is that each phase is changing independently of each other. Well, with recombination, that's not what happens. We have two different parental strains. They go in. They infect the same cell, they go through recombination, and now we have two different strains than what went in. So not a, net, not a natural evolution, um, it's just two, now these strains share parts of their different ancestors that went in. So that is null and void, and it happens a lot in our per sequencing. So we, a couple of years ago, went through um, and sequenced about 100 and some genomes of P2B circulating in the U.S., went in and also pulled everything from GenBank, and we wanted to understand which regions are most diverse and how can we use that to answer clients' questions. So PDB has a spike gene, it uh, simulates neutralizing antibodies, it's used for attachment. We would assume that that's gonna be, has the most variable region in it, and it did. Uh, so this is just an entry pod with the genome on the bottom. Here's the spike gene. Entry levels above this line indicate those are regions that have higher diversity. Interestingly, we noticed that when in the NSP2 and NSP3, there were a very diverse as well. So if you were just looking at one specific region at the spike, you might be missing some things that's happening uh, on your interpretation of that spike sequence because we're missing the NSP2 and NSP3. These changes were held in the amino acid alignment as well. And just another table representing the differences that were occurring in the different gene segments. Again, NSP23, lots of different uh, substitutions and changes, some in the spike gene. The thing is that we don't really know the role of NSP2 or NSP3 in PDB yet. We assume it has to do with some roles against most antagonistic activities, but we need more research to truly understand that. But if a client sends me in a sample, I do full genome sequencing, I can go in and dig in and say, yes, that believes to be very similar or is related to the other strains or it's completely different because now I have more information to make that assessment. Um, interestingly, even though PDB has been in the States now for a few years, uh, we were able to detect recombination. And I did not think that would happen that fast in PDB. So we had just two different strains that were identified in the US. They swapped, we have two parental strains, one in blue and one in red. Then when we had a recombinant strain come out of that. So if PDB is doing that in a couple of years, just think what PERS has been doing through our entire lifetime that has been infected in the United States. So uh, when it comes to analyzing whole genomes of PERS, it's not an easy task. Uh, so I'm going to go into some of the investigations that we have done in the lab. Um, and the question is, can whole genome sequencing answer all our questions? Uh, I'll present some scenarios and I'll let you make that conclusion. So first uh, scenario we have is when 174 strains were hit in North Carolina, um, 
the pathologists were saying, well, we're, we have 174 strains in Minnesota, but they're not as clinically severe as what they're seeing in North Carolina. So being a gene jockey at Bob College, they went in and sequenced the whole genome. And on a pond or five, they had about a 98% similarity, but if we look at whole genome, they had a 97% similarity. So pretty close to each other. But what's happening was that the North Carolina strains went through a recombinant event. So they went through a recombinant event that occurred with an NSV2, and then there was also some of the other um, minor glycoproteins in N uh, or two through four. So I don't know what these major insertions and deletions mean yet. We need more uh, basic research on PERS to understand what's happening. Um, but I do know that they're not the same strain. And so some of these changes that are occurring may be affecting pathogenesis. So that's what we really need to go in and investigate now. Now that we have the tools to investigate these specific changes that are occurring, hopefully we can correlate to that what's happening in the field. So we had, uh, we'll talk about 134 strains. So a couple of years ago, Murtai and myself and the team from the BDL went in and investigated a pathogenic strain from Minnesota that broke into an immunized herd, and we had, they had about 25% piglet mortality. So I had that reference uh, sequence back in our database, and then there was a pathogenic strain from one of the, the vets sent me from North Carolina, and they had up to 42% losses in their finishers. She's like, I've never seen this before. It looked like a 174 strain. We've never had this much mortality. They were gonna go in and depop and then clean that whole barn so they could put new finishers in it. So, or five, 98% again, so the questionable cutoff, is that or is it not the same uh, strain? Uh, but if you look in the whole genome, they're only 92% similar. So what was happening with this? Again, there's a major change in the NSV2 between the 134 from North Carolina and the 134 strain from Minnesota. Interestingly, the 134 strain from North Carolina had that same insertions and deletions in NSV2 as the pathogenic 174 strains that were circulating in North Carolina. So a recombinant event occurred with the 174, picked up that NSV2 region, and then probably led to a more pathogenic strain that occurred. Again, I still don't know what this means. Um, hopefully, as we start building this database of PERS, I can better answer your questions that are coming up. Uh, we don't have very many whole genome sequences of PERS in the database. Uh, from the United States, so as I keep getting more of these strains from this clients, it keeps on building and building. So this was a case from uh, one of our clients uh, from Minnesota. He said, okay, there were five sequences on these two strains are 100% identical, but something's different in the herd. It doesn't seem the same. Something's going on. So we went in and we did whole genome sequencing. They looked like it was about 99% similar. However, as uh, Todd was digging in a little bit more, we found two different variable regions within the ORF2A, ORF3, and ORF4. And within that section itself, there was 94 to 96% nucleotide identity. So ORF2 gets translated, and then uh, these are the SNPs that are related to the changes between those two strains there. And then ORF3 and 4 are interesting. The tail end of ORF3 is actually the beginning of ORF4. So if you see changes in this region right here, it's actually affecting two different proteins. So yes, something was happening in this farm. There was actually two strains circulating that we could pull apart by next generation sequencing, uh, but we weren't able to do that using Sanger sequencing. So like ORF5, ORF2A, ORF3, and B, both elicit neutralizing antibodies. And that also leads for a viral entry into the cell. So again, next generation sequencing helped answer that question for the producer to say, hey, yes, something is different. It's not one strain, it's actually two circulating in your herd. So then my last slide here is, well, the GS sequencing solve all the problems. So we were working with one of my favorite clients on a neurological case. Um, virus was introduced from a, another system, so we were able to get that system sequence and then also get uh, the current client sequence. Or five, 100 percent identical, whole genome, 99.3%, was approximately about 100 nucleotides and 19 amino acid changes. Uh, upon whole genome sequencing, there was no other pathogens found within the client's uh, herd, so they believe it was related to this new PERS strain breaking through. So when I emailed the client back and say, these 19 amino acid changes 
don't mean anything significantly to me. So, a couple of reasons why. One, I'm not an expert on curves, so I sent it to Murkoff. And two, we don't understand what each specific change and how that may correlate to pathogenesis in a herd. So while there are these 19 changes, I can't go to the producer and say, I don't know what's going on. And that's the worst email I hate to send. When I send an answer that's like, I don't know, to me they look the same, and I get the response back like, that's not what we were looking for. Uh, so that leads, leads for more research on my team to go in and see, were there any other undiscovered proteins or that, have, that could have been translated due to some of these changes, um, creating a more virulent virus. Uh, what do these specific amino acids change, etc. And again, I think we now that the tools have changed, we have the ability to do more whole genome sequencing. We can correlate to this what these outbreaks are happening in, in the farm. So we have the good demographics. We can go in and start building our database and try to understand from at least a biological or a, excuse me, from a bioinformatic point what's happening. Once we make some assessments, then we can go in and put it back in the pigs and see if these are these changes are true.